friends, Jerry Rosa here in the Rosa String Works Workshop. Thank you for being so nice to me on my comments and things. And many of you said, yeah, bring on the rant. Well, we may just do that. <laughs> That's a warning to those of you who don't like things that are not absolutely perfectly politically correct because there's not very much about me that's politically correct. I black and white tell things the way black and white things are. So that's a warning to the snowflakes out there that it's probably going to get pretty hot and you could melt. But before we get into any of that, let's talk about the stuff that we can all talk about and hopefully agree on. And that would be this. Yup. I got pretty far yesterday. I just have it laying on there just so you could see what it would look like on the mandolin. And there's the peg head, of course, how it all ties together. Now it's just sitting there. But I think that color scheme goes really well with the mandolin itself. I really like the wood inlay. Uh, it shows all that little extra detail in there. My thought originally was that I might want to paint those or uh, color those leaves green. I still think that could look nice, but I'm not sure I want to do that now. I may just leave it like it is. I don't know. I, I'm really torn on it. I, I really am. I'd be curious to what you all think. I'm putting my hand behind there to try to make this thing focus. I would leave the vine white, the vine itself, but I was thinking about just doing the leaves in green, and I kind of think that might be attractive. I think it might set it off and look pretty cool. Then again, I don't know. I guess I could always sand it off if I didn't like it. So I'm real happy with that so far. Uh, yeah, it could be nicer, you know, if you were a more artistic person and if I wanted to spend more hours and things on it, but that took a lot of time as it is. Well, anyway, that's what I ended up with. I'm pretty tickled with that. We still need to, uh, you know, put the binding on this thing now and the binding on this. I put another coat of shellac on this yesterday. And the reason I did that was because when I used the rubber to wrap around this piece of binding as my test piece of binding to put on, the uh, shellac not being a very durable finish, it just, uh, you know, just made a mess. Even though it was really dry to the touch and everything, it just kind of marred the finish up. So I lightly scuffed it in place or two and then put another coat on it so I got rid of those little scuff marks and things. Now I think what I'm going to do, believe it or not, is I think I'm actually going to go ahead and spray a, at least one or two applications of the True Oil varnish on this because I think that's a much more durable finish and I think it'll hold up to the wrapping with the inner tube much better than the shellac will. I, I really don't know. You know, I'm in uncharted water, really, and I don't know any other way to do it. I, there, and if you're asking me why I went ahead and put this finish on here and this staining and everything before I put the binding on, it's because it's wood binding. If I had waited, the, the wood binding would just get ruined with all this color and, and finish and everything. Now, I will coat the wood binding with finish later, and that's what will bring out the curl in that binding. The order of operations can make you or break you sometimes. So anyway, it's looking good. I just need to stay with it for a while. But on the other hand, I've got lots of people waiting on me on other things. So I may set this aside again for a little while. Maybe I'll put the oil varnish on it let, and set it aside for a little while, let that cure and uh, go on to another project or two. I wanted to add something before I get into this rant, I wanted to uh, say congratulations to my granddaughter, Rebecca. She got fourth in a math competition. There were 10 uh, awards given. The way I understand it, it was a uh, multi-school competition. Uh, in fact, there was an auditorium filled with people. <laughs> so it was a big deal. It wasn't no little bitty, you know, one-on-one -on -one type of competition. This was a big deal. And she got fourth in the, in the math competition. So I just want to say congratulations, Rebecca. I'm very, very proud of you. Did the snowflakes leave? Because it's about to get ugly. <laughs> I don't want to hear you telling me 
You've been warned. I don't want to hear you telling me, you shouldn't call lawyers scumbags. I already had that comment. Well, I don't call every lawyer a scumbag. What I called was a scumbag was those people that do those class action lawsuits. I've been involved in several class action lawsuits in my life, not by necessarily my choosing, just because I was part of the group that bought that product. And I've gotten my whopping payback, my check, you know, for like $8.37. While the lawyers collect millions, millions, doing the right thing, which is going after those companies for screwing the public, for the wrong reasons to get rich, doesn't make it right. Mom and Grandma always said two wrongs don't make it right. They're scumbags. I'm sorry, they're scumbags. And you say, well, the law allows them to collect this. No, what the law allows is for them to prosecute these people and bring them to justice. It doesn't say, the law doesn't say the lawyer should get rich over it. You know, it doesn't say that. But it's legal stealing. And I stand by what I said. The lawyers that do those kinds of things are scumbags. And if you were standing right here and you were a lawyer standing right here and you can tell me you did those things, I'd tell you to your face, you're a scumbag. I call it like I see it. Doing the right thing for the wrong reason don't make it right, period, no matter what you say. Period. End of discussion. You can take that to the bank. That's the way I am. I couldn't wait to get out of AT&T because of almost the very same kind of thing, that same kind of thinking. It's all about greed. And that'll be another rant for another day. I'm not going to get off on the greed rant today. But almost every problem you can think of in this country can be traced back to greed. If you look, if you trace it far enough, it'll go back to greed. You can pretty much bet on it. Whether it's greed for Money, greed for power, greed for notoriety, fame, fortune, whatever, the, you can usually trace it back to greed. Now let's talk about design. If you're a young person and you're getting into engineering and design, I seriously really think you need to hear what I have to say. And the first thing I have to say is there is absolutely no excuse. Did you hear me say no excuse for a poor design? None. Zero. Not one. You can't come up with an excuse that will allow for a poor design and to get you off the hook. A poor design is a poor design is a poor design. What floors me is that we have poor designs in, in a country like this where we spend billions on research, on laboratory, uh, you know, testing and on, on focus groups and uh, surveys and et cetera and so forth. And we still have poor design. And, we ha and, and it's even worse when you think about your building on top of things that are already there, like automobiles, for an example. We didn't just start building automobiles yesterday. Here's where it gets into the planned obsolescence argument. A lot of people brought that up when I made this comment about this rant. Planned obsolescence is entirely different than poor design. I just want to be very clear about that. You can design planned obsolescence into a product. Yes, I understand that. That doesn't necessarily mean that's a poor design. That was done intentionally. That's not a poor design. A poor design is like this. Let me give you a real life, just hypothetical example so that we can all agree what a poor design is. Let's pretend you are designing a house and this is your great room in your house. Just make, play along with me, okay? And we'll watch the camera wash out. <laughs> that, was the argue, that was the rant from yesterday. <laughs> See, I'm not really mad. I'm passionate about these things. So this is your great room that you're designing into your house. And you're going to spend all your time at this end of the, of, the, of the great room. This is where the big theater is. This is where your refrigerator is. And this is where your comfortable chair is. And all the stuff and, and your, your bar and everything's down at this end of the great room. So you're going to spend all your time down here. And whenever you're watching a movie on your big screen TV, you're going to want to turn the lights off, right? So you're going to put the light switch for this room right next to your chair so that you can just reach up and turn it off. 
end of discussion. It's over with. You just designed the perfect great room with convenience galore for you. But you forgot that the entrance to the room is down here. You're spending all your time down here. How are you going to turn the light on when you walk in through that door if the only light switch is down there? Now, that would I'm just giving you that as a hypothetical. We know that that's not the real life scenario normally. We know that. My, my point is, if, if that was your line of thinking and you thought you just designed the perfect room, you just screwed up royally. Because when you come in in the dark and you've got tables and bars and things to get around, how are you going to get down there to that light switch to turn it on? You, it's pitch black. You can't see. You're just going to be running into everything. That would be a horrible design. That's a poor design. That's not planned obsolescence or anything. That's a poor design. So that's what I'm talking about when I say poor design. It's meaning that you didn't think this through all the way. You didn't use the proper whatever to make sure your design was good. Now let's take some practical real life examples. I have a Samsung refrigerator. It's a side-by-side -side door. There's a bazillion of them out there. You can see them all over YouTube because they all have the same problem. The ice makers freeze up on these things, on these Samsung refrigerators. The top ice maker freezes up in a week. Two weeks, three weeks, tops, it's going to be froze up. That's not planned obsolescence. That's poor design. Somewhere along the line, they've designed this thing where it can suck moisture into this area and that moisture builds up and it freezes over everything and it stops it from working. You have to dethaw it in order for it to work again. Mine quit working about six or eight months ago and I just ignored it because we have it has a double ice chest and the there's a double ice maker and the and the bottom tray excuse me the bottom tray down below makes ice also so we just said forget this thing we'll just use the ice down here well guess what that finally froze up too so the other day I took it all apart took the ice makers out dethawed them you know you can say you can dethaw them in place yeah you sort of can and I did that a couple of times but they don't work as long when you do it that way because there's hidden ice up in there in places that you can't see and can't get to and it won't come out ask me how I know I took it all apart and there's ice everywhere and I got all of the ice out thawed it out with a hair dryer whatever put it back together all of it works again that's a poor design. And, and you know that that had to be tested. You know that there had to be focus groups on it. And what do you like about this refrigerator? What do you don't like about it? You know there were prototypes. You know all of that. And yet, it still makes it to the market. That's a poor design. There is no excuse for a poor design. Period. End of discussion. There's no excuse. Period. And if you're a new person coming into the workforce and your job is to design and to engineer things, you need to think about several just key things. What are those key things? Well, first of all, what is this thing going to do? Think about the very basics. Make sure the basics are there. Make sure that the basics work. Think about the fact that it's a refrigerator. We just want to keep things cold and we just want to make ice you know th those are the two key things of a refrigerator the rest of it is all decoration you know now when you can't get the two basic things right what have you got you've got nothing that's a samsung refrigerator and i would recommend not buying one unless you have checked them out thoroughly and know that that problem has been resolved and yes, there are class action lawsuits on that. And yes, someday I'll probably get a check in the mail for $8.29. And the lawyers will collect millions. Scumbags, total scumbags. Sorry. Yeah, you're saying you're going to defend them and say they did all the work. They, you know, Yeah, no kidding. They had their three interns do all the work. And they, they were out on the golf course. And they wrote... They signed like three letters written by their four interns. And yeah, sure. I know all about how that works. Trust me. I was in a, the headquarters of a major corporation and I work with lawyers. Now, I will admit that the lawyers I work with there, for the most part, were pretty good. But they weren't, they're working for the corporation, not for themselves individually. That makes the difference right there. Let's move on to poor design in a car. 
you know I'm night blind. You know I can't see nothing outside. Okay, and that's just black and white truth. I cannot find my car parked 10 feet from the door when all the lights are out and if, it's, if there's no full moon, I have walked all the way to that dang field looking for my car, feeling around, cannot see it, can't feel it, can't hear it, nothing. There's no light out here. This is really country, really dark. Okay. What's that got to do with my car? Well, this 2019 RAV4 hybrid Toyota has lights everywhere. LED lights all over the inside everywhere. I mean like, and I'm not exaggerating, I've counted the switches. There's more than 60 switches in this car. They're all lighted, except for guess which ones. I mean, this is almost well, this is stupid. This is not just poor design. This is stupid with a capital stoop. The overhead light to turn on the lights, those switches don't have LEDs in them. All the other switches do. The unlocked door and the windows don't have LEDs in them. Okay, you're over there. It's dark. You're over there waiting to get in the car. I'm in the dark. I can't see the dang switch. I don't, and, and they're all smooth. So you'd say, well, you can tell by feel. You can, no, these are perfectly smooth. There's at least eight or 10 switches up above and they're all perfectly smooth. There's not even a notch on any of them. There's no ridge on any of them. They're smooth. You just push a button. They're not lit up. How do you turn the dang light on? I, it's just stupid design. If you're an engineer and you're going to be an engineer and a designer, think these things through. Think of the basic things. What's, when you put lights in a car, what are the basic things you need to do? You need to be able to reach them and you need to be able to find them. You know, it's not rocket science. And you might say, oh, they did that to cut costs. Well, why didn't they take it out of, take the light off the defroster then? You know, I mean, like, you know, it just makes no sense. That's much more needed than the defroster. And I need my defroster a lot. Don't get me wrong. I'm just using that as an example. But I need the light probably 10 times more often than I need the defroster. I need the unlock button, you know, 10 times more than I need the defroster. But the defroster's lit up. You know, I mean, it's just stupid design. Got nothing to do with planned obsolescence. Just stupid design. And it's rampant. Take Facebook for an example. Software. See, I designed software. So I know something about designing software. Trust me. I designed it for many years for AT&T. I, design, I helped design and redesign the BOSS system. The BOSS system was the billing order support system. It had over 100,000 online users on the day it went live. And I pretty much redesigned that system. Now, there were, I had a number of other people working with me, and, but I wrote the biggest majority of the requirements for that system. Guess whose phone rang if there was anything poorly designed in there? You know, ask me how I know that there's no excuse for a poor design. Take Facebook now. That's got to be one of the poorest designed softwares that there is on this planet. And now you're going to say, you think that's poorly designed? Millions of people are using it. I didn't say there weren't millions of people using it. I said it's a poorly designed system. It is so poorly designed. I, I don't think I've ever seen a piece of software that's more poorly designed than Facebook. I quit using it several years ago because I just said this thing is the biggest piece of crap I've ever seen in my life, bar none. Let me give you a step away from that for a second. Let me give you another example. I, I use an accounting program to run my business. Now, unfortunately, that this particular program was bought out by a bigger company and they have totally ruined it. It was a beautiful program when it was controlled by the originating company. It's called MYOB, Mind Your Own Business. And it's an accounting software that was designed very simple it it let you do what you needed to do and you know as a sole proprietor i need 
to keep track of my business. But even as good as it was, and, and, and trust me, I knew it was a good one because I, my boss at AT&T, or actually it was Yellow Pages at the time, but my boss wrote articles on uh, software for uh, different magazines. And he had reviewed all these accounting programs, and this is the one he told me to get. He said, you'll like it. It's designed so simple, it's clean, it's perfect. He said, it's the best accounting program out there. So sure enough, I bought it, and I absolutely did love it. But even though I loved it, I looked at it and I went, man, this is really dumb. Why didn't they just do X, Y, Z? You know, why didn't they just do that? Why didn't, on this screen, why do you have to go to this screen and then that screen and then that screen to do this one thing? You know, why didn't they just put that right here and then you could, you know, those are the kinds of things I was seeing in it. It was a great program, don't get me wrong. But the design of it had a lot of things to be desired. I wrote that company a letter and I, I told them, I think, I can't remember exactly how many, but I'm going to say 10 or 12 improvements that they can make to their software. They sent me a letter back and they said, thank you. We appreciate it and we like your suggestions. And they put eight of them in the first release and then they put a couple more of them in later. That's how I know what I'm talking about when it comes to design. I look at things just face on, flat on, here to pat myself on the back. I'm trying to get a point across to these young designers out there, these young engineers. You need to stop and think about what is the purpose of this? How can we do it the easiest way? What's the simplest way to do this? You know, like in Facebook, it's not intuitive. That's what I don't like about Facebook. How many times have you had to stop and ask somebody or Google something to figure out how to do something in Facebook? You shouldn't have to do that. Almost never. Yeah, I realize some things get really complicated. Yeah, I do understand that. But for the most part, at least all of the basic functions should be intuitive. They should be intuitive, meaning that you should be able to look at it and go, oh, if I click this, I can tell this will work. You know, you should be able to look at it and figure it out. If you can't do that, it's a poor design. Period, black and white, that's the end of the discussion. It's, there's no exceptions. You should be, it should be intuitive. You should be able to look at something and know how to make it work, at least in terms of software. That's what software is for. It's to make things simpler, not to make them more complicated. Now, when I was designing those systems for Bell, I can tell you for sure, I'd throw these requirements at these people and they would say, oh, we can't do that. We'd have to do X, Y, Z, and we'd have to write a thousand lines of code. And X. I said, so you'd rather have my 100,000 users go to three screens rather than one screen each time they have to do something? Sorry, you're going to have to write your thousand lines of code, period. End of discussion. And they did, and we were all happy. It's, it, there's just no end to poor design decisions that people make. When I, when I decided to make my sawmill, some people were just floored that I could build the sawmill without any plans and make it work. It's just real simple. You know, you just think of, you break it down to the simplest basic things. You say, what does it need to do? Well, for me personally, all my sawmill needed to do was just take raw logs and make you know, boards. Now, I wanted the boards to be fairly accurate because I didn't want to have to run them through a planer. So that's one of my requirements. I need accurate sawn lumber, which is why I decided to use the screw method, which is the same method I used on my thickness sander there that goes to the thousandth of an inch. I didn't need the sawmill to go to a thousandth of an inch, but I did need it to be very accurate and, and very accurately adjusted. So those screws, every time you turn it one revolution, it moves at 125 thousandths. It moves at one eighth of an inch. So when you're moving things that slowly, you can be very accurate and line up things very good. Now, the trade-off was, and I knew it would be slower to operate the up and down. That's okay. Speed wasn't my issue. Accurate lumber was my issue. You know, the point is you need to get your, your head on straight when you come to make a product or design something. You have to st go back to the basics. Don't start at the complicated end of it. Start on the basic end of it and say, what does this thing really need to do? It's a refrigerator. It needs to cool things down and it needs to make ice. That's 
really all a refrigerator needs to do. Okay, then you can start adding on the niceties. We want it to dispense water. Okay, fine. But when you do these things, you need to understand how to design those things into it so you don't corrupt the original good things about your design. I don't know if I'm beating a dead horse here, probably just preaching to the choir for all I know. It's just rampant in today's world. The next time you use anything, just use anything, look at it and see, is this designed the way it should be designed or could it have been improved? That's how you start to become a much better designer, especially those of you who are going to be entering the workforce. Keep these things in mind. I guess I'm done. I'm probably just rambling at this point. Thanks. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank <laughs> you.